During the last few years, for more and more people, the line between a proper laptop, computer, and a mobile device, like a smartphone or a tablet, has been getting increasingly blurrier. I can confirm that as the owner of a folding phone gets blurrier. As an example, we can see it, this in the web browser market share. As StatCount reports, as of today, 62% of the web market share extracted from browser static statistics comes from mobile phones, with the only a reminder of that coming from desktop and tablets. For more and more people, laptops are beginning to be either a thing of the past or something they only used in their office jobs. Mobile manufacturers did not miss this and several of them have already been playing around with neat software tricks to let their phones behave as a complete desktop replacement for user. As an example, there are Samsung DeX interface which allows a Samsung tablet or a Samsung Galaxy device hooked up to an external monitor, keyboard and mouse to be usable in a similar manner as a laptop or a mini PC would be. This also supports that. With a taskbar that is reminiscent of something that we would see on KD Plasma and uh, the free floating windows for application that can be freely rearranged. Eventually it is pushed even Google to work on a similar desktop mode on stock Android. However, between things like Samsung DeX interface, phones uh, shipping with increasingly larger displays <laughs> again, and more and more neat UX tricks to make tasks that are traditionally carried out on a desktop more pleasant on a smartphone, all of these solutions have one fundamental issue. At the end of the day, they are still nifty tricks to run mobile application in a non-mobile environment, but they cannot real run real desktop applications. The consequence of this is that it has become increasingly unclear whom these tricks are for. Something like Samsung DeX is only practical for basic users who only need to use regular mobile application while also being un advanced enough to want to the, their phones to run like desktop computers or buying something like a laptop, a laptop chassis that needs a mobile device to run instead of being able to work independently. As you would expect, people who turned out to be the most interested in these innovations are advanced users like developers, sysadmins and thinkers. For the longest time, these people have very, had very little use for such solutions due to the lack of power that they entail. As we all know, the Linux community is deeply committed to the noble goal of running Linux anywhere they can. It should not come as a surprise that over the years there have been successful efforts to get various kinds of Linux environments running on mobile phones, from elementary um, user land environments to a complete GNU Linux distribution. Let's start from the latter. Everybody's dream is to be able to run a complete Linux distribution on their phone. If it, this looks like a stretch or something completely unattainable, uh, consider this. Android, the operating system that powers the vast majority of mobile phones on the market, is powered by a modified version of the Linux kernel. From Android's documentation, we know that the Android kernel is based on an LTL version of the Linux kernel as upstream, which is then augmented with a set of Android-specific patches called ACKs. In more modern versions of Android, those patches are distributed as GKI kernels, which stands for Generic Kernel Image. This architecture allows Google, Google to distribute a standard generic Android kernel, allowing device manufacturers to bundle proprietary drivers as kernel extensions. Perhaps this is not quite the same as pure Linux you are running on your desktop, or laptop, um, say for some GPU or network card drivers which are distributed as external programs, even on desktop PCs, but the potential is there. It should be noted that the Android kernel used to diverge from the Linux kernel much more. During the last few years, Google has been embracing upstream Linux more and more in its development philosophy, greatly reducing the distance between upstream. Over time, the effort has been more and more to separate the Linux kernel from Android's extensions, distributing them as separate modules, typically distributed through the Play Store independently of the kernel. More specifically, this change was introduced in Android 14 as Project Mainline. This is the way to go now. Back in the early days of Android, there were some very good reasons to diverge greatly from upstream Linux for 
for example, uh, concerns related to power efficiency. But nowadays, that divergence has proven to cause more problems than it solves. Manufacturers soon embraced this change due to the several benefits from decoupling Android-specific patch sets and proprietary OEM uh, customization from the monolith. Various manufacturers, like Google and Sony, also opened up the mainline kernel ecosystem for their phones, allowing people to develop, install, and distribute their alternative operating systems on their phone. As the distance between Android and Linux kernel has been shrinking for a few years, new opportunities came about. As an example, the amount of devices where it is likely going to be possible to run pure mainline Linux in the not-so-far future has grown a lot. The biggest testament that we have to that is Post Market OS, a Linux distribution that targets various mobile ARM devices like smartphones, tablets, and Chromebooks, and allow and allows users to have a complete Linux experience on them. Of course, the distribution also offers the mobile versions of uh, KDE and uh, um, GNOME des desktop environments and more, which are coming along quite nicely, if I can say that. <laughs> Sadly, however, while the post-market OS project is nothing short of fascinating, adopting it as a daily driver in your everyday life is going to be quite a challenge. <laughs> the first limitation you will encounter, just to begin, is that the fact that it's statistically statistically very unlikely that your smartphone is supported. Mine isn't. Only a bunch of phones are supported and some of them are pretty old or obscure. The second and final limitation you will counter is that this approach with this approach is the fact that completely foregoing Android for a pure Linux distribution on your phone, as cool as it is, implies several sacrifices. Indeed, while Android mostly shares the same kernel as regular Linux distribution right now, it certainly does not share the same user space. This means that the Android application that you are used to will not be, be immediately supported by a Linux distribution on which you will need to pivot to native Linux applications for the best experience. And while there is absolutely a promising and rapidly growing ecosystem of mobile Linux applications that you can peruse, most people will still likely be unable to make do a lot uh, without specific applications that require Android to run. Think of banking applications, full-fledged maps and navigation apps, uh, digital identity apps with to access governmental services, like we have a couple of those in Italy. For now, the only realistic option to run Android application on Linux desktops is to use one of the various compatibility layers, like Waydroid, uh, a piece of software that allows you to run the Android user space in a container. These multiple solutions are, however, under heavy development and they are not really ready for prime time yet, but at least not for most use cases. Linux smartphones are the future, but they are not vi viable for most users right now. Instead, what if we tried running Linux applications on Android for the time being, allowing us to keep using our existing applications, but also run l native Linux programs as well? Well, uh, enter the exciting world of compatibility layers. Back in 2015, the Thermox project saw its initial release. Termox is a terminal emulator that bundles uh, an entire Linux-like user space and it was revolutionary because it finally allowed users to easily run a lot of native Linux and Unix tools on their phones. Opening up um, Termox for the first time feels like a breath of fresh air. It, there's some <laughs> uh, homework going on, sorry. It, it really finally feels like home. You are greeted by your beloved bash shell and you can use the pkg uh, command which uses apt under the hood uh, to install several packages. Up until now, my main use case for Termux has been the ability to install OpenSSH on it and log into my Fedora server to perform a quick maintenance on it or whatever. I have a spoon container, initiated software upgrades and more from crazy places just because I could. It is, of course, more powerful than that as it supports running text editors like NeoVim as well as 
compilers and interpreters like Lang and Python, there is a plethora of packages available and there is a nice surrounding ecosystem. It's not quite my workhouse ghostly setup on my laptop, but it gets me by in a pinch. <laughs> Termox was a pivotal evolution to the Android ecosystem and this application alone pulled its weight as the primary reason why I've stuck with Android exclusively over the past 10 years. It's that good. Sadly, however, it does suffer from some intrinsic limitations that are pretty much impossible or very hard to fix. It is not a virtual machine, it is merely a containerized user land running in a highly sandboxed environment that is explicitly designed to be impossible to break out of. Anything that relies on something like root access, kernel components like namespaces or C groups such as Podman or any sort of hardware accelerated GPU interaction is simply impossible. Uh, heavily limiting what you can do with it. This makes Termux a handy tool for sure, but never a true replacement for a Linux machine, even for simple tasks. Termux is cool, but it can't overstep uh, the boundaries that it's forced to operate within. This is the situation we were stuck until, in a very unexpected move, Google released a beta build of Android with nothing short of a full-fledged Linux terminal, terminal baked in. In a pretty Unpredictab unpredictable move. Uh, it's too early in the morning to pronounce words correctly. Uh, around the end of 2024, Google announced that they wanted to integrate a native Linux terminal in Android phones. In their latest Android 15 feature drop on fi Pixel phones, uh, the Linux terminal is finally here and in all its glory as an experimental feature. Differently from the Thermux approach, the native Android terminal does not run on a GNU user space on top of Android, but rather it runs a full-fledged Linux virtual machine based on the Debian distribution. This solves the main problems we had with Thermux. Since this is a full Linux VM, now we get access to every Linux pro program under the sun, including immediate access to the very fast Debian repos. What's more, we also get support for GPU acceleration, which is does not only allow us to run console application on the CLI, but also run desktop environments and Linux desk desktop applications without a problem. Debian is also an excellent choice for something like this. It supports almost every architecture under the sun. It has been very fast. It has very fast repos on top of every stable release being supported for a very long time, even by third party vendors, by the way, due to being an industry standard. So far, there is only one serious drawback by the design. Unlike Termux, the Linux terminal is not able to access the full smartphone storage, but only the downloads folder, likely for security reasons. While it's still entirely possible to create a Linux folder within SD card downloads to exchange files between the host Android system and the guest Linux VM, being limited to just a shared directory puts some serious limit on what you can do with a virtual machine. Here is to hoping Google will eventually change their minds on this one and allow users to manually allow further permissions to the VM. Still, let's not ruin, let that ruin the party and let's see in further detail how how all of this works. The Android VM relies on a feature called AVF, which stands for Android Virtualization Framework. The AVF is meant to provide secure execution environment to safely run code in virtualized environments, providing even stronger isolation than the one provided by the usual sandbox Android apps run within. Then this can be very appealing for use cases where security is critical, such as mobile devices used in a state government or corporate devices holding um, confidential and proprietary data. The entire architecture of the AVF is based on a PKVM hypervisor. The name PKVM stands for Protected KVM, and as the name implies, this hypervisor is based on a similar idea as the Linux kernel-based virtual machine, KVM, but it has a strong architecture focus on privacy and security. 
The main point of KVM is that it must maintain the integrity of the executed code and everything inside the virtual machine secured and confidential, even if the host Android system or another virtual machine is compromised. As an added functional requirement, PKVM must also be fast to start up while also undergoing a pretty strict boot process to ensure the best security practices available are followed. As opposed to a regular KVM, PKVM is a lot more atomic. The hypervisor and the kernel go from being two separate entities to being the same image and the entire monolith gets updated in an atomic way. So the update process either completely su succeeds or it gets completely reverted, but it never gets stuck into a weird inconsistent state. The architecture of this virtualization infrastructure not only is really incredibly cool, but it should also make you rest easy. Your data is not going anywhere, and since the Linux environment is so well isolated, there is no risk of breaking anything by enabling it. The host Android system and the guest Linux system will stay two very separate domains to the point uh, where what you do in the Linux VM will not be accessible by the Android OS itself. Medium author Cedric Ferry has demonstrated that the virtual machine networking implementation is also pretty good. Interacting with IP tables to manage ports from the Debian side of things work, the terminal, terminal application will just ask you to accept or deny the change to make sure that you know what you are doing and to minimize the damage that it would occur by a rogue script that is trying to poke holes in your firewall configuration. After a port is open and um, well, it is shared between the VM and the host system. It is then possible to spawn a web server on that port from the VM and access it from a browser on the host. This makes web development tasks finally possible on Android device on top of allowing to run client server applications locally on our phone as well. Those of you with a Pixel phone upgraded to the latest software build can now begin giving this feature a shot following the steps outlines in this clip. I'm letting the clip play out. Oh no, it disappeared. Never mind, I'm not letting it. Overall, while in uh, um, its early stages, uh, this feature is seriously cool and it opens up a new possibilities for what you can do with your Android device. Who knows, maybe if it gets developed further, more and more people will truly be able to get away with using their Android phones with a docking station as their only computer if their use case does not require them to run tasks that are not too taxing on the hardware. Regardless of that outcome, though, this marks a new direction for Android, which has suddenly become much more powerful. And by the way, if that happens, my computer has a USB display, USB display port input, so I can literally connect my phone to my computer and, you know, use my phone on the computer. Right now it's useless because the implementation sucks, but if this happens, if I can run Linux application, desktop applications on my phone, but also on my computer, because it's that's going to be cool. It's not happening, right? <laughs> but, but hey, Chrome OS does it. So maybe that's the point. <laughs>